OK, I think we should get started to make sure we <clears throat> have time for all the different presentations this afternoon. First off, I'd like to say thank you to everyone for joining us for our online seminar related to methods and technologies in mechanical and materials testing. Um, we're glad that so many people signed up and that so many people have joined the, the seminar today. Uh, we will be where we'll be running through a number of topics related to mechanical and materials testing. Um, I will be starting. My name is Eric Putnam. I'm a head of department at force for uh, two departments, the materials testing teams and also the component and structure testing team. I will have a presentation here in the beginning on des the design of testing programs. So basically considering testing programs from full scale testing, as you're seeing here on the right hand side of the picture, all the way um, to small scale testing, laboratory testing of materials. Um, and then we have a number of other presentations today. So just a quick look here at the agenda. So I'm up first, then we have uh, Rian Holtstock on welding qualification testing. We're going to take a 15 minute break after Rian, uh, then come back with Mass, with Mass Holm, who's going to talk about um, some more specialized uh, testing programs and the involvement of measurements and instrumentation in those testing programs. Uh, again, a small break. And then we're going to we have some um, external some uh, individuals outside of force that have joined us to present on some of the work that they're doing. The first being from the mechanical engineering department at DTU, the Technical University of Denmark, uh, Jakob Waldbjörn. And then after that, we're going to have Jörg Baumgartner from the Fraunhofer LBF to talk about the his fatigue uh, testing and research activities. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. I need to ask that you keep your microphone muted. Um, there's quite a few people uh, present on online today, and maybe some are coming in, coming in or having to leave along the way for items. So um, just please keep your microphone muted to make sure that everyone can hear the presenters the best. And then if you have any questions uh, throughout the presentations, we would very much like to have questions. Uh, it would, you know, it helps all the presenters have aimed for about a 20 to 25 minute presentation. So we should have five to 10 minutes of time, five to 10 minutes after each presentation for, for to take a few questions. So please write your questions in the chat and provide your contact details with, with, uh, with along with your question. Uh, min minimum your name would be enough, then we can find you also from the sign up information. And if we don't have time to get to your question during the, after the presentation, it will be, it'll be written there and we'll follow up after after the seminar today. And if you have a question that you um, is related to the topic, but you don't want to share it with the with the whole group, you can send it to um, uh, our sit our head of sales who's taking part today, um, Mehdi Benisi. His email is meba at force.dk. Um, and then we will again follow up after the seminar today. You'll hear from us in just a couple of days. So <clears throat> with that, I just quick like to give an introduction to the presenters that are going to be, be talking. So first is myself. I, as I said, I'm head of department for these two areas of testing, basically small scale up through full scale testing programs. And that's working with our teams in, um, in Denmark, in, Brun in, in the Copenhagen region, the middle of Denmark near Odense, where our full scale test rig is located at the Linu Vaft, um, the Linu port of Odense and then also a materials testing team over in Esper, um, where I was well joined by one of our project managers, uh, Rian Holdstock, who will be the one doing um, the presentation on weld testing and welding qualification. Rian has D in, uh, in welding metallurgy and a wide variety of experience from uh, previous experience from joining force at other testing institutes, as well as um, within, the, within the area of um, manufacturing and also uh, fabrication management at um, within the oil and gas and offshore wind sectors. Mass Holm, uh, one of our specialists in structural consultancy, has quite a significant background in, um, in, in uh, strain gauge instrumentation campaigns, as well as with some of the specialized testing running in our uh, materials testing lab in Brunbu, fatigue and uh, particularly fatigue and fracture uh, testing programs. And as I said, we're also joined by Jakob Waldbjörn, uh, who is a researcher at uh, within the DTU within the DTU Mechanical Engineering. Jakob is doing work in um, the focus. One of the focuses of Jakob's work is in hybrid simulation, 
he's working on basically how are we effectively combining um, modeling or simulation and experimental testing to to take advantages of the benefits of both of those items as they're linked in one single testing program. And we'll hear some very information, very interesting information about that later from Jakob. And finally, we have uh, Jörg Baumgartner from Fraunhofer LBF. Jörg is the head of the head of group for numerical methods and component design. He does a lot of work also with um, fatigue and fracture methodologies. And we'll hear some work from here's some interesting um, pieces from Jörg on the the testing programs that they're running down at front at um, LBF. And um, we are we are recording the presentation today and we will we will make the recording available afterwards so you can also get a hold of this contact information if you want to get in touch with any of the speakers individually otherwise again just write your questions in the chat and if it requires follow-up from Jakob or um, Jörg afterwards um, we will be sending those questions that were directed specifically towards them that they can uh, also follow up uh, directly with those asking the questions so I would just like to dive in then and um, as I wrote here we are talking about designing your mechanical testing program so the first piece for us to understand really and look at is the role is the role of mechanical testing why are we doing mechanical testing what do we get out of it um so mechanical testing really is covering two areas it's covering the it's covering um that we want to either characterize the materials we're working with or we want to do some sort of validation and in this characterization what we're looking for is we're looking for design basis information. Um, <clears throat> and as you see, I put a very simple graphic here just to just to give the idea that this design basis information, that's basically the, the database of information about how that material is performing. What is its tensile strength? What is its ultimate strength? Um, its modulus of elasticity, all of these base values that let designers characterize how to use that material in its in their structure. And this is whether we're talking steel, concrete, composites, plastics, all um, <clears throat> pieces that are having a mechanical or structural load, we need to understand these characteristics and we're getting those characteristics most often out of physical testing programs. Then we also have validation. We need to do design and manufacturing ver verification on some products in the, in the testing laboratory. And here, you know, I'm representing that with just a with just a check mark to give the idea to give the indication that what we're trying to do, for example, when we're doing a design verification test, is we're trying to see that the testing that the design and manufactured product lives up to the 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 operational criteria that are that are put forward. So those are really the two categories we're looking in when we're looking at mechanical testing, characterization and validation or verification. Um, <clears throat> now we, as as I wrote in the, or as was written in the agenda, we're looking from small scale up to full scale. And um, <clears throat> we, I'm going to give a little bit here on each testing size as we go through. Small scale, something in the medium scale, and also full scale, where I also have a, some short examples on work we've done at each, at each size. But one of the pieces is, okay, why, why don't we just test everything in, in um, the field in its real operational conditions? Uh, it's real operational conditions. It's the ideal representation of the product and the use case. It's the real, it, it's basically, it's the real product in full scale and it's the real loads. We're not idealizing everything, anything like we have to do in a test bench. Um, this field testing, you could of course do it with a prototype, something that's fully operational, um and or you could actually simply use your fleet to gather data um monitoring of your your fleet to understand and see what kind of feedbacks you're getting just one thing to consider with field testing though is what happens when something when something doesn't work as expected um it's a very expensive adjustment once you've put something into the field even when we're talking operational prototype we're very far in the um in the in the product development stages once we're out in the field. So what we are considering in our presentations today throughout the program is we're really considering what's happening in the uh, on the test bench in the testing lab laboratory. So that's where we want to talk about 
what we're, what we're what I'm referring to as small scale testing, full scale testing, and, and also medium scale. So here you see I have just a uh, basically a dog bone represented, uh, a steel specimen, be it steel, be it be it a composite, a specimen that we're using to get some of that base characteristic data about the strength of the material, how much this material stretches as we how as we pull it, um, how much load do we need to uh, do we need to apply until we pull it apart? Here we actually have what is part of a jacket K node, so an offshore wind foundation jacket. Um, you would have this being one of the main legs of the jacket, and then these legs being the cross braces the, that go out to form the X's um, within the different bays. And then finally, we have something in medium scale. This is actually a scaled down specimen, similar to an offshore node, jacket node, just more of a generalized piece and um, at a partial scale. <clears throat> and what we're rep what I'm representing this in right here is somewhat of, let's say, a testing pyramid, a pyramid sh showing, <clears throat> excuse me, pyramid showing that uh, at the base of the pyramid, this is where we're trying to get that uh, characterization data. We're trying to understand how the materials are behaving. And we also typically do a significant uh, number of test specimens at the bottom of the table to have some better statistics on how our materials are performing, on how our uh, data is being um, generated. And as we go up the as we go up the testing pyramid, you see the pyramid is getting smaller. That's basically in terms of we're testing less specimens. So as we go down, we're testing more of a general specimen. Uh, we were we're more in this area of characterization. We're we're doing larger numbers as we're going up and we're testing, for example, a full size jacket node, or we could take an example of a full size wind turbine blade. Um, there's blade test centers in here in, um, in northern Denmark that they test. They do full scale prototype testing of full scale wind turbine blades. There's comparative test centers in most of the northern European countries that manufacturers use for full scale proto, uh, rotor blade prototype testing. Um, and so in this size scale, we're just we're usually testing one, maybe two of this of this of of a um, design because it's it's much more resource intensive, and with that, it's harder to gain the statistical data. But you're you're looking at different elements when you're looking at full scale. And then we have what is probably a little bit of a fuzzy region in the middle, but that is where we're moving from basically transferring from looking at testing for characterization into test this testing of validation verification. We're moving closer further away from just the base materials and closer to how our product integrates into the full scale system. <clears throat> so I'm just going to go through the testing scales now um, with just a little bit more info and in how we're looking at what we've been doing uh, at these testing scales, how we how we utilize the different testing scales. So in full scale testing, this we had before is field testing, or we can be working in a test facility. So when when we're looking at a testing facility, um, here what I'm actually what's actually pictured is our is a full scale test bench that Force is working. It's refer, we refer to it as linear component and structure testing. This is our full scale mechanical test bench at the the Linu Werft um, near Odense of Denmark where we can test um, the bench is 20 meters long, nine meters wide. On this, we're able to take loads in the multi um, mega Newton category to where we can do full scale testing on um, infrastructure components, uh, building components, uh, wind turbine components. Um, and what we're what we're typically doing here is work within the areas of design verification, model validation, um, compliance, um, also failure investigations, and what happens when we're working in a testing environment is that we have to have idealized setup and loads. Um, here, this could be representing a precast concrete box girder or a box bridge. So if this is part of a, a what should be a beam in a long bridge, you would see that this this piece is just a segment. And in a long bridge, this this would this interface on the end of the girder would be would have a continuous load applied to it or trucks and cars passing over the bridge would be applying loads in a very different way than a, than a given actuator setup could do because with actuators we have to apply point loads 
So you're making trade. You have to make some trade off. You're moving into the tech bench and create this idealized case. And as the as the pieces also cut off, and you know a full si a full bridge is very big. Maybe actually we have the case where we have to downscale. We have to do something at reduced size when we're talking within within a testing environment. Um, but there are advantages to testing environments. We can get accelerated and targeted results. We can reduce the load cases. The maybe the there could be hundreds of load cases for a for an offshore wind turbine that are interesting or that have to be analyzed and designed, but maybe there are only a few of those load cases that could actually be interesting for the blades, for the foundation um, to test in there um, in the testing program. So we can do accelerated and targeted test result uh, programs to get the results that are, uh, let's say, critical to the design. Um, and then when we're talking testing, we're also talking much less risky and lower budgets than is required in field testing. We don't have to er erect all of the um, other components of the product when we're when we're moving into a uh, um, uh, testing facility. Now, the next scale is small scale testing, and I'm just going to put up one slide about it because you're going to hear a lot more on small scale testing from um, Rian and Mass coming up. But small scale testing, that's where we're doing a lot of work really to you know find the material characterizations this is uh, to look into you know these database values that we that designers need or that actually as well needs to be done in verification after a manufacturer maybe has uh, manufactured a bolt to see that that bolt is holding to those database values um, that manufacturers and designers are using um, in determining how their products should be built up and how their products should look <clears throat> Now um, we're moving into that middle part of the pyramid, the part of the pyramid that is elements and components. And as I said earlier, this middle part is where there's really a transition or a crossover between characterization and verification or validation. And <clears throat> you see, I used possibly one of the worst titles on this slide um, that I've ever tried to create um, on purpose to just show that we're representing this area as medium scale, but many there's there's many names that happen within this middle part of the pyramid. Uh, component testing, subcomponent testing, element testing, detail testing. So there's many names that people apply to the middle part of the pyramid where we're moving from, you know, more this material dog bone style up to the full scale. And as we're further down, we're still in that area where you are testing for character characters or um, design values up to more specific um, specific cases that are related to the full scale program. We just dive a little bit more into detail what the that difference is in characterization versus validation. We can actually so um, within characterization as we're in that second rung of the pyramid um, there we can actually in this characterization, we can be looking at, let's say, for example, critical design parameters, parameters that don't necessarily scale well or are dependent on realistic load and boundary cases. Um, one very good example in this is fatigue. Fatigue is um, when we're testing fatigue, the quickest way to test for fatigue is is in a dog bone. Um, uh, at Force and also at Fraunhofer, we all have some uh, high frequency machines where we can get uh, testing done very, very quickly. But um, we have to use very small dog bones that have um, that have small material cross sections um, due to the available applied load of the machine. Um, and it's really an idea a very much an idealization of what we're looking at. We're looking at basically just the, the material characteristics of that, but that doesn't get us information on necessarily how that material performs in the actual product or system that it is acting within. Um, when it's built into a, a product or structure. That work we can start doing and getting more detail, gaining more knowledge as we get closer to our final end product. And that's really in this area of elements um, in characterization. <clears throat> Fracture similar, buckling. Maybe their buckling is also an interesting characteristic um, as um, products are getting buckling is really not necessarily a factor of the individual material. It's much more a factor of uh, how the design of the overall structure is and how um, supported the the different elements are to see if they have um, buckling problems as you're getting um, again closer to the full scale system. Um, and then when we go towards validation, 
uh, here we <clears throat> excuse me here we need to move more towards the final product again and we're actually um, one of the useful areas here is for example let's say you're doing some modeling to uh, FE modeling finite element modeling uh, to lay out determine the stresses the strains how your product is going to be performing under its operational characteristics um, we can we use we can use uh, validation testing along with measurements and monitoring to see how that uh, product is performing um, in this in this area of validation. So just qu quickly running through the considerations as we're designing our testing programs. Uh, we start with our design and manufacturing. Now we can't test everything that design and manufacturing um, might have as characteristics within them. Typically we have some parameters that are let's say the more critical operational conditions. Um, some products need to be designed for fatigue, other products need to be designed for their the ultimate loads that are being put on them, the highest loads that they'll see during operation. So which, um, and then which regions, which elements of our, of our product are the ones that need testing. From that, we can arrive at our test component. Now our test component could only be a piece of the product um, or it could be the whole product in itself. Um, and once we've determined what we're testing, we need to talk about our load and boundary conditions. How are we applying the load? How are we representing those real loads in this idealized testing environment? And how do we grab on to our piece to make sure it doesn't, um, to make sure <clears throat> the loads that we're applying can be reacted and taken down into some test bench? Um, with that information, we can actually finally build our testing plan. We can say, this is what we're testing. This is how we're testing, what, we're me what we need to measure to get the feedback on whether our critical parameters are um, going to be fulfilled. Those measurements, we have to analyze that data. And those measure, um, measurements are, you'll hear some more from Mass on the use of strain gauges, on the use of uh, um, measuring load and what we find out when we're, when we're doing that kind of work. And finally, we're getting our results. Now you see in each of the, in many of these areas, I have play, I have arrows going in two directions, but that's because uh, our test component design is going to function is, for example, going to going to be a function of the the critical parameters that we're trying to investigate. So, um, just to come towards the wrap up on this program now, um, with a quick example of what we've done in, for example, with offshore wind jacket nodes, um, where we've looked at offshore wind jacket nodes in two different publicly or part publicly funded research projects joint industry projects with a number of uh, industry partners in the offshore uh, working in, within offshore wind. Um, so we have, we, we've actually covered within these pro, over these two programs, let's say, um, we've, we've covered pretty good the, the different testing sizes, the different testing scales. Um, within the UDP project, the first project on the list, that project was looking at the industrialization and can we industrialize the manufacture of offshore jacket notes? So much of the testing in that one, there was some characterization testing at the materials level. Much of that one was actually looking more at verification or validation testing. How is this robotically or automatically manufactured node performing in, in its full size? Um, and then within Sea Jacket, Sea Jacket, we were um, looking at what can we, how can we improve the fatigue performance when we're adding additional um, manufacturing methods in? So we were doing more of a characterization study and we're working lower on the on the the testing pyramid. Um, so, in both yeah. of these programs, though, we used uh, <coughs> small scale I've fatigue testing. Report from last time. I'm still doing some of the same work. I'm working on the backplane for the RM, the um, patient module layout. Sorry, can you distribution module? I need to ask you to. Well, that I'm preparing the test for the overcoupling and radome. I think and we have someone on that needs to mute. Thank you. Okay, so in small in the small scale fatigue testing, um, we did test and uh, Mass is actually going to spend a, a few minutes talking more about small scale fatigue testing um, and how we're we're approaching here at Force. But here we did uh, test small scale fatigue testing in both programs because this is nice to generate a lot of data on um, get a lot of data points uh, to understand even just in a base case of what you're looking at. Um, one of the, the big focus of our EUDP project was actually on full-scale fatigue testing, where we were really working within this, this um, 
looking at manually and robotically welded K notes to do more of a design verification uh, program. How were how is the manufacturing coming out in in a full scale fatigue test? Now at this size, we can of course not get the statistical data that we can at the small scale. So it was really it was you know taking that that automatically manufactured node, for example, or robotically manufactured node, and seeing how it's performed against a um, uh, manually uh, welded node with a given assumption in loads in design case. Uh, so what we did through this one was, um, and to understand then how the nodes were performing, what we were getting, we included quite a lot of um, instrumentation on. You can see on the upper right hand side here, we measured the welds where we were, our area of interest was quite closely to get the to get the hotspot stresses and others in the program um, did some very detailed finite element modeling to under to um, see if we could basically use the test to validate the finite element modeling that they were doing. And our investigations here were really into the uh, fatigue failure and looking towards what we had for through thickness cracks. This is the second to last slide, and then we'll be we might have time for one question before we have to move on for Rian. So um, in medium scale testing, here we did a, comp a comparative study program. So we were interested in how different uh, welded conditions on the, or different welding parameters were affecting the fatigue life of offshore jacket foundations. So we took a generalized node and we actually um, across four different weld conditions uh, on 12 different nodes, we, we made each one have the same instrumentation program, the same load level that we could compare node to node how um, these different uh, parameters were affecting their fatigue life um, in this in this parametric study. Sorry for the trouble with the slides there. So this is my conclusion slide. And what I have basically in the sum up is that in our consideration of small, medium and full scale testing, Basically, what we what we have to align on is we have to align on um, what information we're we trying to get out, and what are the and because we need to utilize our resources well because time and budgets are limited, it's, it then comes into a question of um, what information we're we trying to learn and what um, let's say budget do we have to work with to learn that information. Um, if we're trying to learn about material data, for example, fatigue, uh, I I do show everything with pluses. I'm not putting minuses here because my view is you can still only learn something when you're when you're when you're testing. But full scale testing is not good. Is not going to necessarily be the first area of choice if we want to have a uh, good or a lot of data have high statistical certainty on uh, the fatigue parameters of a full scale structure because we can't simply get the statistics that are necessary to have the um, certainty that we we've covered and would have a fully verified design at that level. So um, the sum up is basically then looking at the looking at your needs and looking at the testing scale, the testing size that fulfills those needs. And there I am done and I think I'm also out of time. Um, but I will quick uh, check with Medi to see if we have maybe one or two questions uh, that we could we could just bring bring up quick before we pass it to Rian. Yeah, thank you, uh, Eric. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I just um, wanted to, to uh, just briefly tell everyone that uh, this uh, uh, these presentations uh, will be sent out to you as well as the recording as uh, Eric. Uh, started by uh, saying and also please remember to uh, unmute yourself we just had a, a brief pause uh, with one of the uh, participants um, opening the mic so um, thank you for that and uh, oh there we go okay so Eric, um, before we move on, um, there has not been um, okay. so much activity in the meeting chat. Uh, nonetheless, well, Mary, so yeah. that we can moment. Uh, so.
so that we can stay on time. I'd say we move right on to Rian and I will hang around during the during the break and can take any questions there if uh, if there are any. OK, perfect. Okay. Thank you. So Rian, if you want to start sharing, you can have the. Um... OK, thanks, Eric. Thanks, Mehdi. Um Just let me. Change things around here. Get uh, sorted. Okay. Hi. Right. So hopefully you can you can see on on your your monitor you can see uh, the start of my presentation. Um, I'll just hit the the PowerPoint presentation mode so that we can start. OK, so. My name is Rian. I am a project manager at uh, Force Technology. And uh, I work for Eric in, in the materials and, and testing with uh, a specialism in, in welding. And what I'm going to try and talk you through today is one aspect of my work, one one part of my work. So if you bear with me and um, if you follow me, then hopefully we can get to know each other and, and we can uh, progress a little bit more on 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 the topic. So a bit of housekeeping. What I'm going to ask you to do is to please mute your microphone um, and also your your video. And if you have questions, send them into the chat uh, or even better, send them to my colleague Mehdi. The email address is there. Now, as I'm the go through all those questions uh, and of course the other thing is is that um, I may not know all the answers so if you do ask a question and and if I don't answer it um, please add your contact details and then what we'll try and do is we will to the best of our ability answer that question and get back to you and and all everything will be treated confidential confidentially so uh, Please feel free to ask whatever you want to to ask. All right, then for the next slide. The agenda for today is we will be looking at qualifying a welding procedure, but it's not the whole welding procedure. It's, it's only one part of it, and I'll discuss that as, as we. We progress. I'll give you a historical perspective on destructive testing, just a few slides. I will try and define or give you my definition of destructive testing. I'll show you a few uh, typical test methods, describe the relationship uh, to welding, how, how these test methods relate to welding. Then I'll introduce the, the topic of essential variables, and I will show a few examples, and at the end, uh, two slides on what works and what doesn't. Right, so we start off with qualifying a welding procedure. And uh, some of us out there, we would be familiar with this. Um, just bear with me, what I'll try and do is, is I'll start off with the basics and, and I'll progress to something that's possibly a bit more challenging. Um, but we have to start with the groundwork. How, how do we qualify a welding procedure? What are the general steps? And experience tells us that um, this is the most common flow of activities. If we look on the left hand side, the top left, there is a design. So we have to design something and it's got to be welded. So we then have a design. And the next thing that we need to do is we need to weld a sample. This sample is then tested, and the, the two forms of testing, it's, it's either non-destructive and it's destructive testing. The results of that testing goes into what's called a welding procedure qualification record, WPQR. Those results are then analyzed and assessed and examined, if the results comply with uh, the requirements, then a welding procedure is qualified. If, however, those results do not comply with the requirements, 
then we need to start all over again somewhere on the left hand side and it, it varies from condition to condition but that is the the general flow of activities now for today um, because this is quite a huge field what my task for today is just to share with you some information related to destructive testing how do we test that sample that's been welded and that answer then feeds into the welding procedure. So it's one of the key components of qualifying a welding procedure is the testing. All right, if we go back to a bit of a historical perspective, I'm sure that um, the idea of strength has been around for centuries and, and very long time. You know, probably our ancestors stayed up at night thinking that spider web up there how many of them do i need to catch the next mammoth isn't it easy to do that but of course to do that we need to know more about the properties of that spider web and i don't think our ancestors had uh, the full grasp of things if we move on to things that we are more familiar with um, metals then uh, recent discoveries tell us that the oldest metal artifact is thought to be about 6,000 years old. And this was a tool that was used to make holes in leather. And, and it was for clothes and, and uh, it was unearthed in, in the Middle East. So that some things are stronger than others. This we, we I think we discover this very quickly. Then if we fast forward to about 500 years ago, uh, a gentleman by the name of Peter van Musenbroek, he is accredited of being one of the first people to describe machines for testing and tension and compression and flexure. And um, we see there on the right, there's a, a small lovely painting of a very handsome gentleman. And on the left hand side is the machine that he is accredited for inventing. Right, if we get back to the spider's web, remember the spider's web, we, we're dealing with a, a very fine, a very thin bit of material. Two gentlemen in the United States in the 1940s uh, named uh, Harold Hinman and George Burr, they were working on a project to replace silk for the use in parachutes. And they couldn't really find a machine that was accurate enough. So they just went and invented one. And the, the machine combined electronics and mechanics, and it also gave a, a printout of, of the test. But one particular breakthrough was that they could also control the speed of testing. And if we have a look at that printout in the middle, that is a single file fiber of wool. So that is my attempt to relate it back to the spider's web. OK, destructive testing. You will encounter mechanical testing um, for today, for the webinar. Uh, they will be interchangeable. Um, I will most likely use destructive testing more frequently than mechanical testing. So what is it? What is destructive testing? What is mechanical testing? It's, uh, it's a branch of science and engineering that tests materials so that the visual and the physical and chemical properties can be determined. Examples are strength, toughness, hardness, microstructure and chemistry. But of course, today we are focusing on welding. The typical methods and I'm sure the vast majority of you out there are familiar with uh, these, or at least have, have heard these before. Tensile testing, impact testing, bend testing, fracture testing, macro examination, micro examination, hardness testing. And then a little bit more advanced is our toughness testing and our fatigue testing. That uh, toughness testing, there's the, the fracture toughness testing. And I will, after this slide, I will go through uh, a few of those. And each description will 
I will try and tell you what the test is used for, what is the data that is can be generated, what is a, a general cost for them, and also how long the test takes. So we start here with a, a tensile test. Now, um, for those of you who have a sharp eye, you will see that, yeah, it looks like a tensile test, but it's uh, it's a little bit modified. <laughs> this, this was my um, easiest non-Google image that I can get from a, for to represent a tensile test. It's actually taken from a, a fatigue test, so a lot of those wires and, and uh, things that you can see there, they are not generally not part of a normal tensile test, that is from a fatigue test, but but the equipment is, is the same. Um, the idea here, if, if I use my mouse, is um, that we have two crosses and we have some clamps, and these clamps grip onto a test specimen and the one goes up and the other one moves down and by controlling the uh, the speed and uh, this the of this we can destructively pull the specimen apart so what sort of data do we get from this we can get yield strength yield point elongation uniform strain the strain hardening elastic modulus, um, a stress strain diagram, and of course also the location for fracture, whether it is where we think it would have been um, in the case of a weld, was it in the weld, the heat affected zone or, or the base material. To do the tests is pretty quick. The results can be uh, given on the same day. Um, it takes minutes to do the test, but I must add that to machine a tensile specimen can take a while. So what I'm giving here is I'm excluding the machining time. The machining time is, is uh, as a rough guesstimate, just anticipate one day, one day per 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 condition. The cost, the cost is medium. It's not a cheap test. It's not an expensive test, but it's uh, of course it's all relative. But but this is um, I would give it two dollar signs there, two out of four. Right. Then if we go to impact testing, what we can see here on the, on the right hand side is that we've got a specimen with a notch in it and um, it is supported by these anvils. Then this striker, it is released, it's, it's pulled up uh, to a certain height, it's released and it strikes the back of this specimen. And how this material resists the striker from breaking it apart, that is shown here on a scale. And normally we, uh, we refer to as the impact energy. So our sample is machined, it's placed in the anvil, the striker is released, it smacks into the specimen, and the resistance is measured up here. Um, we often do this at varying temperatures. So what sort of what sort of data can we generate? The absorbed energy, the notch toughness, the level of ductility, um, minimum temperature, um, elongation, the ductile to brittle transition temperature, percentage shear fracture area. The test time is relatively quickly per test. The results could be made known on the same day, but we normally need to do several of these. We don't, we can't just do one. We uh, typically do them batches of three. And also it falls into the, the mediocre, similar to, to what a tensile test will cost. And um, unfortunately, we don't have enough time to for me to go into very much details about every test. My idea is just to give you a general idea of how these tests work. The next one is an easy one and it's a it's a cheap one. It's a very quick and cheap way to check what's inside the weld. This is a uh, generalized, we call it a fracture test. So the idea here is you have your welded sample and you machine a defect in it. And this could be any way you like to, to machine the defect in there. Um, normally it's it's done by a saw and then we smack it with a hammer 
or you put it in a vice or you put it in a press and you bend it open or you bend it to a fracture. You then get your fracture faces and these can be inspected. It's often used for welder uh, qualifications. It's a very easy test. It's a very quick test. And many people also do this at their own facility. The, therefore, the, the, the cost per test is, is on the cheap side. It's, it's one of the, the cheaper tests to do. Gives us visual data and it can tell us quite a lot because it's a quick way to tell us what's happening inside the world. Uh, if we do non-destructive testing, ultrasonics or radiography or, or dye penetrant, we can't see as, accurate, as clearly inside the world as we do if we break it open. Another, another test uh, which is also used often for well application, but used test. It's also a relatively cheap test. The results can be done on the same day and um, uh, it's also possible to do this on site. Um, the, the idea is that you, you take a welded sample and you produce a rectangular section. That rectangular section is then bent either um, around a former or in this case um, by by this uh, this attachment we get a bend now the bend has to be a the are radii associated with this so i think that's one specific thing we can't just bend it around anything we choose there are some specifics that we need to do but the idea is that we bend it and that bend then has an effect on the weld it, it then gives us the ductility of the weld or the ductility of the heat affected zone, the fusion between the weld and the base material. Um, and if everything is fine, it, it can give us a, an idea of the internal quality of the weld. So you may not be able to see it, but we, as I've tried to illustrate here on the left hand side, we can evaluate the um, different parts of, of the weld. Macro examination. Um, this is another way to look what's inside the weld. Uh, we'll show weld parts and how the weld fused to the base material. It could also show us if there are any big flaws or impurities inside the weld. It's the, the results can be known very quickly, and the results done in the same day. Normally uh, a welded sample is cut open, then it's um, we use grind, uh, a, a grinding paper, um, and then afterwards we polish it and we etch it. And you can then see the macro details of the weld. So important things there is, is dimensions. Dimensions, how are the welds um, laying on top of each other? How big is the heat affected zone? Are there any big holes, circles, rips inside there? Very frequent, very often used uh, examination. That can tell us a lot. Next one is the micro examination. There, the, the, the intention there is to show us the microstructure, whether, you know, ferrite, cementite, martensite, arsenite. Um, Similar idea to the macro test, but now we just use the microscope and we look even deeper, even further into the welded sample. The results can be given on the same day and the test is, the results can be known pretty quickly. The data generated type of microstructure, the grain size, the impurities, uh, the uniformity, of the structure and also um, can tell us whether we have uh, uh, carbon steel, modern acidic steel or, or synthetic steel. It can, it can tell us more about the internal structure uh, on a micro scale. Next test that we do 
is a chemical analysis. And the idea here is that we take our test sample and we spark it. So uh, it's um, energy is used to, let's say, burn the sample, which then give off gases and they analyze those gases in some clever way and, and it gives us a variety uh, of the elements and it also gives us the percentage of the elements. So once the test is finished, the uh, main thing we can get out there is the carbon equivalent. Uh, we, we get our, our, our chemistry, our chemical elements, and from there we can determine the, the carbon equivalent. It can also help us to define whether we dealing with Freudic, Austenitic, Martensitic, or, or, or duplex, duplex uh, uh, steels. Um, this is often used when we don't know what the material is material characterization. So we, we there's been a mix up of, of the steels or, or um, we have something, but we don't know what it is. One of the easiest and quickest ways is just to do a chemical analysis. We can get a, um, a printout of what the elements are in there and that will then help us to define what the steel is. It's, it's not, it's a relatively cheap test and it's relatively easy and quick to do. The other one that's also relatively easy and quick to do is a hardness test. Um, it allows us to evaluate the microstructure, but in this case, in, instead of uh, trying to work through the different microstructure, it just gives us a numerical value. And this numerical value is then we, we call the hardness. So it's a cheap test. It takes uh, uh, minutes to do. The results can be done on, on uh, can be done on the same day. When I talk about minutes, of course, big issue here is whether we do it manually or whether we do it automated. If it's manually and we've got a thousand of these hardness readings to do, yeah, then it's going to take a little bit longer. But with today's technology, um, in many cases, we can put a sample uh, underneath at their hardness tester and just press play, and off it goes, and it gives us our hardness values. So the advantages, um, the data we can get is hardness of the weld metal, hardness of the base metal, hardness of the heat affected zone, or we could uh, look at our, our micro and we can say that there, I'm very interested in that bit of micro structure there. What is the hardness? And we could, depending on the type of hardness measurement we use, we can then target that a specific microstructure and, and get a hardness value for it. Now we get onto something that takes a bit more and is on the expensive side of the scale. Um, what I mean by expensive is if you're a small company, it would be expensive. If you're a large company, then it's relative, depending on the information we get out of it. But it's expensive because it takes a few days to do the tests. And there are also many samples are required. And what these tests show us, what these toughness tests show us, it shows us the, the well's resistance to failure in the presence of a known flaw. Um, it can help us to predict when repairs or maintenance are required. And, and we'll see a bit more uh, later on when Mance does his uh, presentation. But things like plain stress, plain stress, with opening, displacement, R curves, J integrals, uh, plane strain fracture toughness or the CTOD and plane stress fracture toughness we can get from, from these. Then the last slide here for the, the test methods is fatigue testing. And um, what the yeah, my description there is, is it's wrong. It's not. It shows us the performance of a weld un, under fatigue loading. It should be not shouldn't be tensile loading. But uh, and Mass will he will describe this this more. But similar to the fracture toughness testing, um, it's these could be expensive tests because they take quite a few days to do, and several test samples are required, and and the the machines are operating in some cases 24 hours a day. 
So it, it's a, a continuous operation. Several samples are available and that pushes up the price. So the data generated cycles to failure, uh, SN curve, yield point, uh, location of, of fracture threshold. These are things that we can get from our fatigue testing. OK, but now we've got to look at a weld. So we've got to take a closer look at the weld. What do we see? We see two heat affected zones, two weld metals and two base materials. In most cases. Um, actually, in all cases, I think. If we change welding variables, then we could change the strength, the ductility, the toughness and the chemistry of well the important thing because after this we're going to talk about essential variables so changing variables that affects the strength ductility toughness or the chemistry these would then fall under this essential variables a few examples of these essential variables are the type of base material the geometry of the test piece with its pipe plate branch connection thickness of the test piece, position of welding, filler material, welding process. There's a whole range of them. And um, the tricky thing now is, OK, how do we know what's an essential variable? Some codes will call it a, uh, um, have another terminology for it. Um, but the idea of essential variable is the same from, from, from a middle So the codes and standards, recommendations and specifications, they will tell us, they will say, if you change this, you need to requalify. So the important thing there is that these essential variables, or as ASME calls it, non-essential variables, um, these essential variables, if you change them, the danger is we have to requalify our welding procedures. So how is it related? So the test piece is created, it's welded with specific characteristics. Those specific characteristics are then tested and the results are recorded. And those results are used for the procedure qualification. So if we go and change later on, if we change any of those variables, that and it could have a negative, then we need to requalify it. And when I was creating this presentation, I was thinking, all right, what, what is the message that I want to, to give to you today? I think the message is, is if, if you are faced with, with a challenge, with an idea, with, with a thought, you know, how do I solve this? Then one of the first things I would say is start with looking at the essential variables. So let's look at two examples. We've yeah. got a two pipes being welded together. The wall thickness is 20 millimeters. Um, we've got one process for the root and a second process for the filling cap. So let's assume we've got a TIG for the root, uh, GTAW, and we've got uh, stick welding for the filling cap, SMAW. So the question then is, if it's not clear in the requirements, how do we know where the impact tests should be extracted from? The question can be then answered by, OK, let's look at the essential variable. So here is an ex extract from one of the uh, welding codes, and it says, if you look at the yellow boxes, impact tests, we need two tests. And down the bottom, that says, look at footnote D. We look at footnote D. One set in the weld metal and one set in the has of the for materials bigger than 12. So one in the weld and one in the has. So that means we only have to do two. The problem is we have an additional essential variable here. Hello? I'm just going to interrupt for two seconds. Two seconds. Zarek. Zarek. Hi, Eric. Um, um, it is, it two, is o two o'clock. So we're, we're, um, we're, we're actually, actually at the break time. Okay. But I think Rian has some good information to share. So if you just want to run into the break, Rian, um, for those that want to stay and hear what Rian has to say, um, that would be, of course, 
great, but we're we will start with mass at uh, 1415 sharp. Um, so I would recommend basically just to leave the meeting open with mute on or in with yourself muted and um, we'll pick up with mass at 1415. But Rian will take a couple minutes just to just to finish up his where from where he was for those that want to hear this piece. No, okay, thanks, thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Uh, so, so we have two sets of essential variables there that we got to check. We got to test. Um, so, when we look at our codes and our specifications, sometimes we need to look a little bit deeper, because what it says, and and many of you out there, you probably know this. What it says in black and white. There's a paragraph somewhere else that says you need to do more. Okay. Um, next one is. We've got a, a digger bucket that is is cracked, it's fractured, and we want to we want to weld, use weld repair. So the big question is um, the base material here is high strength and high hardness, and there's potential for high tensile residual stresses in the weld. Do we need to do post weld heat treatment? Okay, we can then look at this potential variable. So it could be that the code tells us that we have to use post-weld heat treatment. We also then look at the material certificates of the, the digger bucket here, and it says this was uh, heat treated. So then the obvious idea is, OK, we now have to do heat treatment after welding, which is going to cost a lot of money and add a bit of time to it. But the clever thing about welding is that the welding parameters can be engineered, and this can reintroduce similar base material properties in the heat affected zone. And the heat affected zone is, after all, the base material. So if we can show that the, that the, the weld or the, the, the repair has then similar properties as the base material, then we may not have to do the post-weld heat treatment. OK, so I've got uh, two more slides and then I'll be finished. So the, the, the main idea, the main concept is think of essential variables. Essential variables in most cases will allow you to solve your welding question, welding metallurgical question. Um, then how do we do it? What, what will work? Well, you need to define your variables to test. Then you need to define what the specifications and the codes and standards that you want to use. You've got to define the test methods, the acceptance criteria, and then what to do if you have an unwanted result. And in this case, um, all of these have to be very specific. If you start with this, then you take away confusion and gray areas if you are very specific in what it is that you want to do. And then, of course, what doesn't work? If we have unclear definitions uh, of essential variables or the specifications or the test methods or the acceptance criteria or unclear definition of retesting, then we're just going to be running in circles. So in conclusion, we've had a look at a, had the qualifying a welding procedure um, from mechanical testing, destructive testing. We've defined destructive mechanical testing. We've looked at uh, typical test methods. Uh, we've looked at welding. What is, how does a weld look like inside? We heat effect is own base material, weld metal. We've this essential variables, this key idea for today. Then we know that the welding codes can, can help us to look for the, uh, how to define things. We've looked at a few examples and then we also had a quick look at what works and what doesn't. So then finally, um, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat or send them to, to my colleague, um, to, to Mehdi, and we will try and get back to you with an, an answer um, as soon as possible. And thanks for your attention. Uh, Eric, are you still there? Yes, thank you, Rian. Okay. Um, and since we are in break time, I think we'll um, we'll just we'll pick up at fourteen fifteen. And um, Rian, I did see that there was one question in the chat, but maybe we'll just 
um, we'll, uh, we'll ask you to catch up with um, with uh, on that question when um, in in an email after the after the session. Okay. So for all those that hung on, see you again in about um, just a little under 10 minutes uh, at 1415 when we start back with Mass. And Mass has some, as Rian and I had said, some interesting uh, information on some of the more advanced testing programs uh, that we're running. Thank you. So it's 2.15. <clears throat> um, and to make sure we stay on program and that we are able to um, here as much as we can in our in the time we have left um i would say we get going with mass uh, again if you have any questions please put them in the chat or send an email to medi m-e-b-a at force.dk um and with that i'd like to ask mass to share his screen and um that we hear from him hello I'll just need to share my screen one moment. Is it that one? Can you see my screen? Can you hear we me? We can, Mass. We got gotcha. you. Yeah, You're good, good to go. Good. So yeah, my name is uh, Mass Holm, and uh, I've been working here at Force for eight years in our department for Structural consultancy, where I've been working mainly with the uh, fatigue life, uh, fatigue of uh, welded structures, fracture mechanics, fine elements, storage tanks, uh, pressure vessels, and yeah, mainly everything that has something to do with metals, steel, and aluminum. Um, but in this uh, time that I've been here, I've been working together with our department uh, in mechanical testing where I've been involved in a lot of fatigue testing and fracture mechanics testing and a few other tests uh, or other testing as well. So uh, as you can see here on the first photo, uh, yeah, the name of the presentation is the measurements and instrumentation, validation of your product or system. I just like to mention the first photo here that is a fatigue specimen with a welded bus attached to it. Uh, and not easy to see, but there's also strain gauges uh, attached close to the well toe of the of this bus. But uh, it's just an example of uh, one of these uh, tests that we're doing. So uh, this is done in high cycle, uh, high frequency fatigue. We have uh, four test machines with uh, various uh, load ranges and maximum loads. The largest one uh, can go up to a maximum force of 600 kN. It can also do that in compression. But the load range is uh, limited to 600 kN, but they can do it in both in compression and uh, in tension or a variation of both. The test frequencies range from 80 to 130 hertz. Uh, depending on the size of the machine, the dimensions of the test specimens. But uh, for large dog bone specimens, as you saw in the first photo, uh, the test frequency usually lies around 80 to 100 hertz. So, uh, but getting up in the test frequency is not always necessarily what you want, uh, you can get a high enough, so high frequency that uh, the heat generation will be difficult to control. But when we are around the 80 to 100 hertz uh, and still with high loads, uh, load ranges, it's still possible to keep the temperatures uh, quite low. Another test setup you can see here on the right is also uh, done in high cycle fatigue, and uh, it's a uh, Conrad that uh, is being tested here. So what are the advantages of high frequency fatigue testing? Well, one of them is that you can actually quite quickly generate a lot of data to uh, qualify or generate new SN curves for uh, any uh, fatigue imposed details 
should be it could be in base material with uh, a local stress concentration, could be welded details, or some kind of special components can also be tested. And that's also why I have the third photo here. And that's a third test setup where we have three point bent. Uh, so you might ex you could expect that uh, the high cycle, uh, the high frequency fatigue testing might be limited to special components, but uh, with some custom setups, it's actually quite versatile with uh, where you can actually make quite a lot of different setups to, uh, to test different uh, components. So, but if we go and get back to the test frequency, you could say that uh, at 80 hertz, you can test 10 million cycles within 35 hours. And 10 million cycles is usually when we are doing fatigue test of weather components that is uh, specified as the run out uh, where we stop the test if it hasn't fractured before. When doing fatigue testing, uh, additional information is often required if you want to qualify uh, SN curves uh, from the data you get. For this, we often attach strain gauges to the specimens. To one thing could be to measure the uh, nominal stress to verify that the, the actual load is applied to the specimen. In the photo showed here on the right, uh, we have two strain gauges attached uh, close to, uh, to the weld toe. So here we are trying to measure the hotspot stress or the stress concentration factor at the weld toe. Strain gauges are mounted on both sides of the specimen. You can also measure the degree of bending, which also might be uh, a necessary, uh, necessary information for qualifying the SN curve. Furthermore, the strain gauges can also be used to uh, validate a uh, fine analysis. Uh, so, yeah, they are quite useful uh, in this regard. Regard. So, what can we use all this data that we generate from these uh, fatigue tests? As I said before, uh, one of them is to qualify new SN curves or in general, if you want to improve them to, so you can use less material in your designs. The example here shown on the right is just an example. It's not from uh, real data because it's, uh, we're not uh, allowed to show that to, uh, so, but it looks, it could look like this for uh, a test series that uh, looks like this. Um, in this case, we have test, uh, there are 20 specimens tested, and three of them are runouts, two at the lowest stress range, and one at the second lowest. But uh, when we're doing these uh, tests, we can generate, uh, directly we can generate the mean curve. The mean curve is the broken line, blue line, as you can it goes through. Almost you could say that half of the dots are on the right and the other half is on the left of the line. From the data set you obtain from the fatigue test, you also get the standard deviation. And uh, when you have both the mean curve and the standard deviation, you can generate the design curve, which is the whole blue line, as you can see. Um, when doing these uh, statistical analysis to generate the design curve, uh, at least I have experience in using both the normal distribution and the student T distribution. I have, uh, myself, I have been working on a larger project for a customer where they uh, also wanted to generate new SN curves for different uh, fatigue details. Uh, the project started uh, actually them contacting us and asked if it was possible to do it. And then we actually ended up making the, the entire uh, specification of the test program. Uh, it got approved by a certifying partner who approved the methods where we actually installed strain cages on some of the specimens. We measured everything on each specimen, uh, the width, the height of the weld uh, excess, material and uh, the transition radius, the transition angle from the base material to the uh, weld. So everything was documented and uh, 
So that's just to say that it's depending on what you're trying to generate nested code for, it's good to have a certifying partner uh, if the to begin with uh, to start before I start the testing because they might actually have uh, some suggestions that they require if they have to certify uh, the structures you're going to set up later. So what is important when doing these fatigue tests, be it uh, small scale fatigue tests or large scale for that matter, it is actually that the weld quality uh, is that the weld quality uh, is controlled uh, because you need to reproduce the the weld that you are doing a test on. Also, you can reproduce them in the actual structure. We, because if you make a weld that is of very high quality for the testing, then yeah, if you don't do that on the actual structure, you, you can't use the SN curve anyways. Next thing I'm going to talk about is fracture mechanics. And to begin with, we will go with the fatigue crack growth or FCG. On the two photos here is from a larger project we were a part of where we tried to verify or challenge the actual fatigue crack growth curves from uh, the British standard 7910. Uh, as you can see here, we have a lot of measurement equipment on the specimen. On the first photo, you can see there are a camera on each side of the specimen to measure the growth of the crack. And on the, the back side, you can see there's a straight gauge attached. And on the second photo, you can see there's a clip gauge attached, attached, attached to the crack mouth opening. The reason for these, uh, all this measurement equipment is the project was specified as, well, we have to measure the crack visually by a camera. And because we have to do the test in a corrosive environment afterwards, we also need to install a strain gauge so we can correlate the crack length with the measurement on the strain gauge because we can't have cameras in the uh, seawater and the clip gauge would actually be destroyed when it, if it was uh, submerged into seawater. With the strain gauge, we can uh, we can insulate from uh, the gross environment and actually use the measurements there. So we did a correlation between the crack growth and crack length to the measurements we did on the strain gauge. The clip gauge was actually for internal verification to see if we actually measured the same with the clip gauge that we did with the cameras. So how to obtain these fatigue crack growth curves? The specimens uh, we have experience with using is uh, the compact tension. I will show a photo of them uh, later in the presentation. But they are shortened as CT specimens. On the photo, you can see a test conducted in a corrosive environment in seawater. And uh, here the strain gauge is attached to the back and is doing all the measurements that we need for uh, how the crack growth do, grows during uh, these fatigue cycles. So for this project, uh, well, we were testing both uh, base material and uh, weld material in the heat affected zone. And uh, it was carried out both in an air environment, but also in a corrosive environment. So that was actually four fatigue curves we were trying to verify slash challenge. So how do we do these uh, fatigue crack growth curves? Uh, well, first, you make a start notch in the specimen and you do a fatigue pre-crack where you actually lower the stress intensity at the crack tip so you get a very, very sharp uh, crack tip. After that, you can do the threshold test, where you, which is actually quite similar to the pre-crack, but you start with a very sharp, sharp crack, and then you can find the threshold value for where the fatigue crack growth actually stops, where, the, where the, the value for where lower values will not generate any fatigue crack growth. After that test, you can do the constant load test or the stress intensity increasing uh, test method where you generate a fatigue crack growth uh, curve, which can be seen here. 
on the left photo, this is also from the project. Uh, you see the light blue curve is for base material in air, and the blue dots is for the specimen called specimen seven. And as can be seen, the yeah the dots are a little to the right from the curve, but there is some kind of uh, scatter in the results from this. But in general, uh, it looks uh, quite good. But that's how the fatigue fractal curve would look like. So if you have when you have the constant load or the k increasing method, the first uh, plot on the curve is uh, the first one down here. And then as the intensity factor increases, uh, the you go up the curve like this until final fracture initiates. On the right, you have the photographic image of uh, how we measured the crack growth during the test. I think we took uh, photos, I don't remember if it was every 10 minutes or something, uh, but uh, we've had and before we started the test, we had made some uh, scratches uh, with a distance of five millimeter for reference, and then we could calibrate the to calibrate our measurement software, and then we measured the crack growth uh, at different time intervals. Then we have the fracture mechanics, fracture toughness. To the right, you see uh, the different specimens that uh, we test. The first one on the top is the compact tension, as I mentioned earlier, which we also use for fatigue crack growth. So that's the compact tension specimen. The second photo is the single edge notched bent, or SENB specimen. And it's uh, actually during testing, you can see it. So the different Test methods we have for fracture toughness is K1C, which is a, an elastic fracture toughness test, where we do not allow uh, for much plasticity in the crack tip before uh, final fracture. This means that we want a brittle fracture in the specimen. Then there's the crack tip opening displacement, or CTOD, and the J integral method. CTOD and J integral allows for plasticity in the crack tip. So uh, if the material does not behave in a brittle, uh, does not have a brittle behavior for the actual thickness, then a CTOD or j uh, method is necessary to use for determining the fracture toughness. The procedure is, uh, again, to make a fatigue pre-crack, to have a very short, sharp crack tip before testing commences. Then you do the test, and afterwards you need to measure the fatigue, uh, the the crack, the fracture surface of the specimen to see if it complies with what you have measured uh, during the test, and it lives up to the requirements of the standards. What this has been used for, or what we have seen, is that uh, for cast materials, uh, it has been quite interesting for some of our customers to actually get the actual uh, fracture toughness and fatigue crack growth curves to be able to keep more material or say in another way to not discard uh, the materials due to small uh, defects or to allow for larger defects uh, in the castings. So that is one of the practical uh, ways we have used this or we know that it has, it has been used. But in general, for all this fracture mechanics, it can be used for engineering critical assessment. As an example, I can say that uh, I've, I've been involved in a project where uh, quite a lot of structures were installed, and afterwards someone found out that uh, or they couldn't find the NDT reports for any of the wells that had been uh, carried out. And uh, so they decided to do uh, NDT on all these structures and uh, they actually found several uh, indications of wealth defects uh, in these structures. So uh, again, we were asked if uh, 
it was possible to see if these uh, indications they were critical for the continued uh, operation. And uh, what we did was, uh, yeah, we got the stress ranges for for 20 years of uh, operation. We had the defect size, uh, including the size, the length, the width, the depth of the indications. We had the material resistance, uh, the fracture toughness. We used the standard uh, fatigue rack growth curves from the BS7910. And then we did an assessment of all the four types that were present in these structures and uh, categorized them as if they needed to be repaired or if they could be continued operation with uh, certain inspection uh, intervals or if they were safe for further fatigue rack growth. So that is one way of uh, actually using these uh, fracture mechanics uh, in a, a more practical manner. When we assess uh, defects or flaws, we use this uh, failure assessment diagram where we look both at the fracture ratio in a brittle fracture and on the, on the y-axis and on the x-axis we have the yield ratio. And then the flaw is placed somewhere inside here if it's safe. And if the flaw grows, then you can follow the red line until it reaches the blue line. And we actually have a critical flaw size. Another test that I have been involved in is a slip test to actually measure the or to determine the slip factor for various surface treatments in bolted connections. What is important here is actually you need to control the bolt load quite carefully. Um, we have done that with the uh, strain gauges in the bolts to make sure that we have the correct preload before test commences. Then we measure the, during the test, you measure the slip of these uh, two slip planes. You have the uh, one on the top and one on the bottom. The test is a, a standard test that is actually described in the EN 1090-2 Annex G. Um, and uh, initially you have to carry out five tests, uh, where the fifth one is a creep test. The creep test has a risk of failing because it's tested for a, a little bit of a longer period than the first four specimens. But during this period, then you too much, then you need to do extended creep tests of three additional sp uh, specimens. In the end, you will obtain a characteristic uh, value for your slip factor as a 5% fractile value with a 75% confidence level. Finally, I will talk a little about residual stress measurements. The example shown shown here is from a bridge higher uh, in one of the in one side of the bridge, and uh, after the fire, the bridge deck was inspected, and when getting into the bridge deck, uh, it was discovered that some of the stiffness on the bridge they were buckled, as you can see on the first photo here, down here. So that was due to the heat would expand the material. And uh, but yeah, it probably couldn't expand that much because the, it was stopped from uh, external boundaries. But then when it cooled down, then it would contract again. And then hence the buckling of these uh, stiffness. So the, yeah, the responsible for the bridge, they were worried uh, if these uh, residual stresses were too high and if they had to do something about it. So I was involved in this measurement campaign where we measured the residual stresses on the bridge deck. As you can see in the photo on the right, it was done with the hole drilling method where we bore a little hole in the center of a rosette string gauge, which actually measures the release of the stresses when you uh, make this little hole. You can see there are two strain gauges attached. Um, the first one with the hole drilling is for measuring the residual stresses. 
the other one is just a dummy gauge to making us able to uh, remove the measurements from the traffic that uh, was uh, running over the bridge during the testing. So uh, we could see whenever there was a car or whenever uh, a truck was driving, then we got a huge, uh, uh, huge changes in the measurements we got. So we need to, we needed to remove these, uh, this noise you could call it. So we did the holdering both on the side where the fire had been and also on the other side where the which was unaffected by the fire and the result was there was actually quite a large difference in the measured residual stresses so yeah that was my presentation thanks for listening Thank you very much, Mess. Um, Mehdi, how are we on the side of questions? Mehdi, you're muted. Sorry. Can you hear me, Eric? Yes. Yes. Yeah, perfect. Thank you for that, Mass. Um, but uh, b before uh, I just uh, before I ask uh, mask uh, a question, I I think I owe um, someone in the chat uh, Axel um, to uh, get his um, question answered by uh, Rian. Are you there, Rian? I'm I think, yeah, I'm here. Okay, it was uh, concerning the OES testing, uh, which you just covered uh, in your presentation. Axel writes, uh, is it not the light we are looking at? Yeah, hi Axel. Yeah, the OES is uh, the optical emission spectroscopy. Spectroscopy. Axel, you're right. It is the light that we're looking at. Um, so what the process is is, my understanding is is that the atoms are vaporized, and um, this creates a plasma. So the the plasma or the excited atoms create a, a unique uh, emission spectrum. And that emission spectrum is then analyzed. And each element has its own unique spectrum. So the light that is generated is then analyzed. So Axel is right. OK. Thank you for that, Rian. Um... And back to you, Mass. Um, uh, although there were no question in the in the chat, um, we actually got um, a couple for um, during the registration uh, from from the audience. And one of the questions were concerning the high cycle fatigue testing. Yep. Um, should uh, you be wor uh, worried about temperatures in fatigue testing? Well, uh, yeah, if they get too high, you have to. Uh, but uh, I would say that for these tests that we have been conducting, we have always been able to uh, keep the specimens cool e by either by air cooling or in some tests we've actually done it with some uh, oil that we have uh, continuously been spraying over the specimens. Mm. So, but at, at least as long as we can keep the temperature between uh, as a certain uh, limit, then uh, it shouldn't uh, be a problem. Uh, I've seen some okay. studies that says that uh, if you're below 100 degrees, it shouldn't change the fatigue life of the um, uh, of the tests. But uh, usually we are way below. Uh, we are we are below 50, even so uh, we rally above that. Okay, okay. Thank you for that, and thank you for that uh, question um, as well. And uh, over to you, Eric. I think uh, the next presenter is up. Actually, Manny, we're headed for another 15-minute uh, break, and I know it's odd just to have one presentation and another break, but we didn't want to make anyone stay. Um, we didn't want to keep anyone going for more than an hour at a time. So we're going to take another quick 15-minute break, okay. and then um, <clears throat> we will uh, come back at 3 o'clock with Jakob, and he will be um, highlighting some of the very interesting work that they're doing at uh, DTU in their um, 
mechanical and structural testing laboratory there. So um, let's see everyone again in 15 minutes at three o'clock and we'll start up with Jakob. Um, thank you. My name is Jakob Valbjørn and I work as a researcher at the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the Technical University of Denmark. Um, uh, just to to talk a bit my, uh, about myself, uh, I'm I'm heavily involved in mechanical testing, uh, for all the way from coupon all uh, to uh, from coupon to large scale testing uh, when we're talking link scales. Among those, I'm working uh, within hyper simulation, uh, which will be the topic of today. Um, just to give you a short introduction and background within hyper simulation for structural assessment, um, the purpose and aim, um, it had been like hybrid simulation had been around since the 1960s, late 1960s, but it had been work, uh, it had been utilized for, for um, uh, earthquake engineering. So, for example, when you have a, a bridge structure where we, for example, want a, a, a look at some details around a column, uh, for example, shown here in the figure, uh, hybrid simulation could be of, of, of huge benefit as we can actually simulate using a numerical tool, simulate the behavior of the full bridge while taking out a small part of the structure, in this case being the column, so what we do is that we simply handle the, the column using a, a transfer system. It could be a server hydraulic system uh, while handling the reminder in a, in a, uh, in a, a numer through a numerical engine, uh, which could be uh, Abacus, Ansys, uh, and, and other commercial available uh, codes or, or custom-made codes. Um, the, the concept have, is, is also called hardware in the loop, hybrid, hybrid testing, uh, and, and uh, it is heavily used both within the quasi-static, soda dynamic, and real-time regime. So when we talk quasi-static, it means that both the numerical part and the experimental part is handled quasi-static. Soda dynamic, uh, here, the the dynamic effects are only included in the in the numerical part, while real time hybrid simulation, all the the real time effects, all the dynamic effects are both included in the numerical and the experimental part. And just to give you an insight into the approach, uh, I've put in a, a a classic frame structure here uh, with a viscous damper. And here I've shown, you can say the boundary, in this case called the shared boundary, uh, like separating the numerical and experimental substructure. Well, we have the frame structure, which are well known and defined in the, in the numerical software. And then we have the viscous damper uh, being handled experimentally. So the idea is that we, we simply apply an external load in this case being an acceleration, uh, an earthquake, so we have a, a time history. Um, and what we do is that we, we in iterations, apply, apply that time history to the, to the fine element software. We get a computed displacement, in this case being a, a, um, a, um, a deformation of, of, of that bar or that shared node of the, of the of the viscous damper and that deformation is then fed over to the transfer system um, and then applied as a as a single degree of freedom deformation to the viscous damper in return we get a reaction force which are then fed back into the into the position where the the viscous damper were 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 taken out of the structure and and that that enables us actually to to uh, to mimic the structural behavior of the full emulated structure and then of course we we go to the next iteration the next load step in in the procedure what i would like to to uh, to uh, present here is a it's another concept we are looking at at d2 which we call single component hybrid simulation so the one i i 
I presented before, which originated in, li in the late 1960s, is what we call multi multi component hybrid simulation. Here we have a a discrete we have a discrete uh, um, point actually defining the shared boundary. In this case, being a viscous damper connected to a, a simple frame structure. Here, the shared boundary is a discrete point. Uh, in this case, being uh, defined by one a single degree of freedom, but it could also be multiple degree of freedom. And that is today used both. Uh, within earthquake engineering, which, uh, which, uh, for which it has been used for many years now, but it also been used within the automobile industry and other industries as well. But all of them, we have this shared boundary being defined by by a, a, a discrete point. So here at D2, we we are trying to 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 expand the capabilities of of hybrid simulation by allowing a a, a shared boundary. Uh, which which could be in this case here a, a continuous edge. Um, so that continuous edge, of course, uh, would 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 constitute of uh, would would be a infinite number of of contact points. Uh, so so the whole procedure here is to define a finite number of points, which at the end of the day could could uh, could represent that that shared boundary that continuous shared boundary uh, we we are here defining as the, as a shared boundary so the architecture which we are using at d2 uh, is is a is a uh, is a, a software called open fresco and that's actually a software developed by uc berkeley previously we used labview uh, with with a software which were made through a couple of master PhD projects at uh, at D2, but now we have we have uh, we have decided to switch over to a more uh, or to a commercially available software package. Um, the middleware software is open is open fresco, uh, which again enables us to 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 make the communication needed between the MTS software. Which is operating the PID controller, so the server hydraulics, uh, and and uh, yeah, what we call here the transfer system, and then the the other side, which is uh, numerical software, uh, which in this case we're using Ansys, but it could be whatever commercially available uh, fine element software. And on top of that, we are also using uh, some some uh, different. Um, uh, helping tools from M MTS, for example, a, a coupling matrix, which are defining the relation between the partitioning uh, and operation of the multi-axial load train. So it could be when we have a, a, a advanced load train um, uh, operating multiple degrees of freedom, how to relate a, a, a dwarf deformation into actuator deformation. Um, so now I'm going to dig into different case studies which we are working on at at D2. So um, first of all, we are we have been looking into a substructural scale testing on an SSP 34 meter wind turbine blade. So the idea here is to to take a full blade, a full wind turbine blade, and then separate it into a experimental substructure and numerical substructure. So seen in industry there are huge uh, there, there have been seen huge problems in 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 the, in the transition zone uh, of these wind turbine blades meaning that the root end section of the blade uh, have have shown uh, structural issues so what we are using the ssp 34 meter blade for is a test vehicle you can say to demonstrate the the potentials of using a a a, a hybrid simulation tool so what we have here is as you can say the experimental substructure and the numerical substructure is in this case separated by a single degree of freedom uh, so we have simplified the shared boundary to a single degree of freedom uh, operated by by uh, free dwarfs uh, so we have its wise deformation flat wise deformation and a a torsion working in the longitudinal direction of the blade. 
Um, and here you can actually see how the experimental substructure is built up. Um, we have three actuators. Actuator C here handling the, the flap-wise deformation, and we have the two big vertical actuators, which are up handling the torsional degree of freedom and the and the its wise de, uh, deformation. And this test rig here, we are able to to apply forces up to 50 kilonewton in the flap wise direction, 100 kilonewton in the in the its wise, and 100 kilonewton meter torsion. And the the and the the structure we are looking at is the inner root section of the blade. It's a 15 meter long section. So in our case, we are only looking at the first eight meter, meaning that the remaining part of the experimental substructure is a gate zone. So we have we we need we need some area to 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 merge out the stress concentration induced by the in by the uh, by the load train, uh, which are actually shown here by the by the red area. We have this boundary introduction zone. Um, so that's that's pretty much demonstrated here. As you can see here, um, the 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 structure itself is is uh, is a cantilever beam uh, in principle. So previously, looking at an earthquake structure, you could still take out the viscous damper and have a statically determined structure, uh, which were were self-carrying. In this case. Of course, taking out the inner part of a cantilever beam, you have a, a, a static undetermined structure. Uh, and the way we the way we're handling that is that the experimental soft structure is simply defined as a super or as an element with a with a predefined stiffness. And that stiffness is then up to, uh, is then updated according to the to the to the structural response of the experimental soft structure. So that will be updated on the fly in order for the miracle substructure or for the full hybrid simulation analysis being able to to mimic the response of the full emulated structure. And here again, I'm just I'm just showing some of the uh, the, the the key uh, the key properties of the experimental substructure, uh, which are a, a build up in our structural lab uh, at D2. Another another uh, uh, test setup we have been looking into. Uh, it's more or less you can say a, a, a test vehicle on on the uh, on the a, a test vehicle for our for our SSP blade. So again, we have a cantilever beam, which are separated in a numerical substructure and an experimental substructure, and here. We have implemented a, a, um, a, um, a you can say a, a bit elongated hole in the in the shear webs in order to to uh, to, uh, to implement some nonlinearity in the experimental substructure. And again, the the shear boundary being located here in between the numerical and experimental substructure is defined by a discrete point being loaded in in three degrees of freedom. So here you see an image of the experimental substructure while having the remaining part of the of the of the beam being handled numerically. Um, and as you can see here, and a huge amount of nonlinearity were achieved. Uh, uh, here we have the compliance of the experimental substructure. Uh, so at at reaction forces around 200 newton, we actually achieved a significant amount of nonlinearity, and these this reaction force is is represented uh, as the vertical deformation, or this is this, this uh, displacement and and uh, related reaction forces for vertical displacement. Another uh, uh, case study we have been looking into is uh, is a project uh, which uh, in which D2 have been involved for a glass fiber reinforced polymer power pylon. So the whole idea here is instead of having a a, a classic uh, a classic power pylon of of a, a steel frame structure, 
architects are looking into the possibility of using a glass fiber mast uh, uh, on which the electrical conductor is attached. And one of the major benefits of using that is that you can you can save all these uh, electrical isolators because the the composite material is an electrical isolator in itself. So uh, what we have done until now within that project, we have built up a a um, a, um, a beam, a a, um, a arm, and that will be that part of the arm here. Uh, being extended out of the of the column, um, which is attached to the to the to the vertical strong wall in at the at the D2 structural lab, and in that on that arm a number of nine actuators is attached in free loading points in order to mimic the structural or oh, sorry the, the the forces induced by the by the cables by the electrical conductors and the idea here is simply to to um, to uh, simulate the behavior of the electrical conductors numerically while having the forces acting on these conductors fed into the to the to the arm to the glass fiber arm and here we are uh, investigating a phenomenon called galloping. So that's a phenomenon, a dynamic phenomenon happening at, at certain wind speeds and certain wind directions. So when, when having, when having uh, uh, these effects, you have, you have these cables galloping up and down and to the sides uh, at, at a certain eigenfrequency. And we are interested in investigating how that mass is reacting to to uh, to these forces and how how the uh, cr how the cross coupling is functioning so the the numerical model is simply going to be these wires which are hanging by by a spring and then the spring stiffness is going to be updated uh, along a timeline as we are we are acquiring uh, the stiffness response from the from the structure itself and then last but not least i want to i want to present a a a a, a hybrid simulation a project which we are looking into uh, at the moment through a, a a a project actually in cooperation with Ford technology where we're looking into corrosion fatigue on offshore, offshore structures. And here we are actually looking into jacket note, uh, K notes, where, where, where we want to investigate the, the, the structure and integrity uh, of, of uh, welding connections. So we want to, to investigate the behavior of the immolated structure when having a damage, a crack propagating through these welding joints. So the welding, the welded joints in the K node is gonna be handled in an experimental soft structure where the arms of that K node is loaded uh, by a axial force and a bending force. So in this case, this, this is just a demonstration. It's it's not necessarily the way it's going to look, but but this is this is how we at least until now is 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 intentioning to to build this up. So we have the numerical substructure, which are going to be applied a a certain design load, and we get as shown previously a displacement, which are going to be fed into the experimental substructure. The structure is going to be loaded, and in return, we get a restoring force. And this loop is going to continue in a fatigue test series. So we have one one test, uh, sorry, one one numerical run, which is going to going to go through the system, and then the displacement is going to be fed into the experimental substructure. And that displacement is going to be, uh, or, or cyclic load is going to be applied to the structure until a certain stiffness degradation is is um, is detected and then the reaction force is going to be fed back to the numerical substructure 
and a new load iteration is going to be applied and a new deformation cycle it's going to be fed back to the experimental substructure and the whole process is going to is going to uh, continue so in this way we are able to monitor the behavior of the full emulated structure while having a a a, a damage propagating in in that Kano joint and in that way we can actually adjust the the deformation response on the fly as as the load is redistributing in the structure so that that is one of uh, one of the major benefits uh, of of using hybrid simulation and hybrid simulation within fatigue testing is a, it's a, it's a brand new uh, field we are walking into and uh, that'll be the end of my presentation so any questions you're all welcome to to uh, to write them uh, in in the webinar here or, or forward as a mail uh, i guess that eric would be able to forward my my mail address. We will make sure that any questions is reached you, Jakob. And thank you very much for the interesting presentation. Thank you. So I need to check with Mehdi to see if we had any questions come in. Yeah, Eric. Um, no. There is no questions in the chat, uh, but I did receive a couple of uh, in my email, which I will uh, forward to Jacob. Okay. Uh, so. Thank you. Yeah. No I problem. look forward to. Yeah. Great. Um, now, maybe we can just since we have a couple minutes before before Jurg is supposed to be um, going on, maybe we should just take a take a small recap of uh, what we've. Um, been seeing. Oh, actually, here we have a question coming um, from um, Siemens Gamesa. Uh, are you able to see this directly, Yaga? Yeah, I see that. So, like, just just to to uh, to summarize here, within the automotive industry, what they are using the hybrid for is, for example, when you have a a a test vehicle with suspensions what they do is 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 they are actually simulating the vehicle running through a terrain uh, of of uh, with a, an amount of bumps and and with a certain speed and then the 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 reaction of the ground is actually fed into the into the suspension of the vehicle as it as it runs uh, uh, as it runs through the terrain I can I can try and forward some uh, YouTube videos, for example, showing that if if uh, some of you are interested. So that that is just that is just one application in which uh, hybrid simulation uh, is 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 used. Uh, and and yeah, you can you can you can probably call it a load simulation. Yeah, a, a kind of load simulator. Um, the, and is the, it Is it basically the case, Jakob, that um, part of that system is very nonlinear? So simulating is very difficult. That's the that's the that's the reason for the physical testing. You can, yeah, that's the, like the the main the main motivator of using hybrid simulation is that you have you have a certain part of the structure, which is unknown, and 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 proved difficult to 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 uh, to handle numerically, and it could be. A damper, for example, a viscous damper is highly nonlinear and 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 speed dependent. There there are there are many complications, and also when we talk suspension systems on test vehicles, uh, it's the same issue. So and 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 that is that is where that is where these uh, these um, uh, these tools here are are of huge benefit. Also, for example, as I just as I just mentioned, for the wind turbine blade, where you have a root, the root end section being the 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 area where where we are looking at at uh, at different uh, um, uh, damage modes. 
uh, which we want to handle experimentally while while actually being able to fairly simple handling the tip end of the blade numerically that could solve a lot of issues in the wind turbine industry as wind turbines today, wind turbine blades today are, are getting very big indeed. So instead of keep on building uh, uh, bigger and bigger test facilities, uh, hybrid simulation may be a, a, a valuable uh, tool in the toolbox uh, for, for, you can say, more advanced substructural testing, where you're actually updating your your load response uh, according to the to the to the compliance or to the feedback of the experimental substructure. So as the, as the damage propagates, or you get and non other nonlinear behaviors of your experimental substructure, the the load response of your of your 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 on your experimental substructure may change as well due to aerodynamic forces or of loads. So for wind turbine blades, it's actually a twofold effect. Is they're you know getting even longer and more flexible. They have these these non-proportional responses to the load input. But then mm. if fatigue damages are occurring, you actually have a changing structure from let's say load cycle to load cycle, which is what uh, it sounded like you were evaluating in as well this new project. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like you have in 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 for example with with the frame structure you will you will simply see a redistribution of loads, but for the wind turbine blade, if you if you do to 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 uh, damage propagation in the root end start to see a change of global compliance, the blade itself will start to 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 change its angles it, its angle and position in in the wind, thereby changing the aerodynamic characteristics, the aerodynamic forces, which again will affect the, 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 the load response or the load applied or the deformation applied at the, at the experimental substructure. That's very interesting. Thank you. Yaga. So that again, like builds on the, on the classic substructural approach, you can say. Wonderful. So, just that short recap, because I think Jörg's presentation is going to run up probably to the end. So we started out talking about, um, you know, kind of overall in general uh, generalities about um, mechanical testing, mechanical testing programs, and then dove into some specifics on uh, welding procedure qualifications, the kind of base characterization type tests that are used in that program. Um, had a look further at more specialized um, materials testing programs. A lot of this work uh, we talked about from force was analyzing the area of metal was an, you know, looking at testing within this area of metals. And then just now we moved into the um, presentation from Jakob where Jakob uh, really kind of took those, let's say upper two parts of the test upper sections of the testing pyramid to look at what's happening in the component testing regime how much can we learn with this kind of you know advanced next generation um set of testing um hybrid simulation granted i we heard it's been around for some some time Jakob, but you all seem to be moving into new industries um taking some of what it maybe had as limitations before and expanding its capabilities i think it was a very interesting presentation and also gave us an uh a different perspective on you know testing size scales and um, testing of components made out of different different materials composites and metals um, and what we're what we're seeing there um, so now I think it's time to move on towards you know getting a little bit of an international perspective to the to the discussion um, and uh, welcome Jörg um, Jörg are you with us yes um, I see your screen's up, but you're still muted. Can you hear us, so, Eric? Yes, yes, oh, yes. There sorry. we go. There we go. Sorry. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, yeah, yeah, it was a problem. Uh, when I started sharing my screen, uh, the Teams window just disappeared, and I had to find it. <laughs> okay. So, so. Um, Yes, so uh, actually, actually uh, I, you can hear me and you can see the screen. So that's a perfect situation to start. 
we'll just pass it off to you, Jörg. Thank you for joining us, and we're looking forward to hear what you have to say. Okay, yes. Thank you, Eric, uh, for the introduction, and um, hello, everybody, to my talk about uh, fatigue testing and research activities at Fraunhofer LBF. Uh, I just have shortly my uh, camera on, so you can see um, so how I look like, And uh, but I'd like to, to turn it off again uh, during the presentation to keep uh, uh, or to spare the bandwidth. So um, let's start. Um, I have a short, um, or I'd like to give you the agenda. So we'll start with a short introduction of myself and also introduction of LBF. Then I'd like to give you some overview about testing at uh, our institutes, uh, show you some own developments, but also the possibilities uh, we have for standard testing. Um, Important is, and we heard about that before, is um, the validation uh, of what we do, uh, what happens to the specimens, to the components uh, during testing. And um, very crucial is um, the experimental strain analysis to really identify what's up, what's happening. Of course, the failure behavior is also quite crucial. We heard about it. A crack initiation uh, can change the dynamic of the structure and um, this has to be recorded also doing fatigue tests. And finally, I'd like to conclude with some currently running um, research projects at LBF, so you see where the focus is right now. So um, yes, that's me, a little bit picture maybe. Um, I studied uh, mechanical and process engineering at Technical University of Darmstadt, and I'm working at uh, Fraunhofer LBF since 2005. Um, uh, as you see, my PhD thesis was about the fatigue assessment of welded joints considering the sidereal stresses. So um, I started also in 2005 uh, with the fatigue assessment of welded joints. And um, this was also the topic of my thesis. So actually, I have now 15 years of, of experience with welded structures and the fatigue of welded structures. Um, currently at LBF, I'm heading the group numerical assessment and component design and um, also be active in other positions. So. Um, I had the working group three stress analysis within the IIW. Uh, I uh, also have uh, the lead of the German uh, working group Q1, that is design and calculation. Um, so, and uh, had uh, the num uh, workshop numerical simulation within structural durability. So, uh, you see um, mostly about welded joints and uh, also numerical simulation, what I um, deal with. So with this short introduction to my person, I'd like to give some small facts about um, Fraunhofer LBF. So we are approximately 380 people in Darmstadt, and we have an annual research and development budget about 30 million euros. Um, where does our funding come from? Uh, so we have uh, public research programs, uh, probably as uh, it is also for uh, Danish universities. So some funding from the state, some funding from the, the European Union. We have private, uh, public private partnerships and also industry uh, related research and developments. So on the lower side, you see here um, the position of the uh, institute in Darmstadt. So uh, this uh, um, buildings belong to, to LBF, uh, this in the back and this in the back. And uh, what we see on the right side is here in the, in the main testing hall, um, the facilities we have to perform fatigue testing. So um, as you can see here on the, on the bottom lower side, uh, these are standard test rigs for standard uh, fatigue tests. And uh, we also have some, some cubicles I show uh, you in the next slides what's in there. So we have um, some uh, possibilities to um, yeah, uh, to test uh, or to perform a fatigue testing of components or uh, materials. I'd like to start um, with our own development. So uh, one um, quite historic development was the Zwab, uh, that is German and stands uh, as acronym for B actual wheel testing. So um, actually this is um, of course related to the automotive industry. So we have here um, such kind of a structure where, um, where the wheel is inserted. So um, um, this outer structure is rotating and the wheel is pressed to the uh, to this uh, outer rim 
and uh, with uh, two actuators we have the possibility to introduce uh, two loads so uh, it's like um, a static wheel load and also a, a load occurring uh, to the wheel um, during uh, driving in a, in, a, in a band so in a curve and um, of course uh, when we perform such tests we also have load spectra um, how these loads are applied to represent uh, for example, 300,000 kilometers for um, a standard passenger vehicle or um, 600,000 kilometers for a truck. Right now we have a new development. Uh, this is a Walt a wheel accelerated live testing machine here uh, on this hexapod. And you see you have, of course, a lot more possibilities um, to change the position of the wheel in such kind of an outer rim. And uh, therefore, also you have the possibility to introduce much better uh, or let's say more realistic loads. Another uh, development at LBF, um, and there we go to quite small components, as you see on the smalls uh, on the left side here. Um, we have uh, this uh, piezoelectric test trick. So um, um, we have not a hydraulic cylinder or some, some electric uh, a motor. Uh, to, uh, that generates um, the machine, but it's a, um, a piezo stack. And this one is used for um, introducing the load into small specimens. So with this with this test setup, we have the possibility to test up to, to one kilohertz, so um, uh, quite fast. And we also have the possibility uh, to perform very high cycle fatigue um, tests. And in addition, it's also possible to um, to run a variable amplitude loading. So it's not like standard resonance testing machine limited to constant amplitude loading, but we can really test load spectra with this test setup. As you said, um, we have quite small components. So here you see a small components that was taken out of a of a welded joint. And here this small orange area is uh, actually also a strain gauge because uh, we saw it before, uh, to measure what we, um, what load is applied uh, is always crucial to identify uh, if the load is applied correctly. And, um, and of course we need to, 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 to verify this. Um, another possibility um, is um, we can do with this piezoelectric test trick for example, um, some displacement controlled testing. So we have here a currency of uh, one micrometer um, that we can achieve with this test trick. And um, here's an example shown uh, that electric connections from control units uh, for electric vehicles are tested. So um, on the right side, it is the setup. So here you have an, uh, a pin and this is inserted into an, a printed circuit and the uh, connections or the electrical connection between pin and circuit is uh, not performed by a soldering process, but it's just performed by a contacting um, between the pin and this circuit. And uh, as you see it here on the um, left side, uh, there's a special shape of this pen, and with this um, uh, you can guarantee, or let's say you, you can uh, have some contact pressure with, um, between pin and printed circuit. And um, what you can imagine, um, if you now have loads that could be thermal loads, yeah, to, due, to, um, uh, due to heating up and cooling down of the system, but also uh, vibration loads due to um, driving, uh, we have some small um, movements between the pin and the circuit. And um, the testing um, that was conducted here was to identify the um, fatigue strengths of such uh, connections. So it's much different than we, we, we heard before. So with these uh, huge uh, welded components uh, we saw, so here uh, quite in a miniature, but uh, in, principally, uh, in principle, the testing uh, principles are the, um, are the same. So um, we also have, uh, I call them standard test tricks, so um, resonance testing machines uh, in, um, with which we can test uh, between uh, 20 and 200 hertz um, and load capacity between 20 and 600 kilonewtons and servo hydraulic test tricks um, with a load capacity from 5 to um, 2,500 kilonewtons. Uh, 
also have the possibility to test under hydrogen. Um, so uh, we have one test trick to, uh, to, to, to test under, or to identify the effect of hydrogen on the material behavior. Um, then a 25 channel test facility for cars. I think this is uh, a cause LBF um, has, has quite a uh, let's say strong connection to the automotive industry. So we we have the capability capability to test here uh, these uh, whole uh, s, um, car structures, and uh, also uh, various test machines for multi axle fatigue testing. Where here, for example, was also tested um, a weld joint under multi axle um, loading conditions. In principle, we have two possibilities. Um, we have can perform strain control test. So uh, we apply here a strain gauge at the specimen and um, control the strain amplitude. So we get material data from these tests, but and we hold, we can have also con load control tests. So we have here also it's an it's a brace joint that is clamped here in the test rig, and there um, a load is applied. So the load is constant, uh, and in principle uh, we have these two possibilities that I think represent 95% um, of all uh, tests we perform in our institute. Um, we saw it before and um, maybe this is a, a good uh, thing to, to go a little bit deeper into detail um, mm -hmm. because I think it's very crucial and very important, um, especially if you want to um, use the fatigue tests furthermore into um, uh, in a finite element analysis and uh, also in a development of fatigue assessment approaches that is uh, mostly what we do in our institute. So um, what is shown here is an overlap welded aluminum joint. So uh, here's the joint, it's clamped in the test rig here uh, on the top side is a load cell, uh, on the bottom side is the servo hydraulic actuator and um, we performed an, a strain analysis for this. Um, so we have a strain gauge one and two. Um, this is shown here on this side. On the bottom side, it's directly on the opposite. And um, this is actually chosen to, um, to, to measure a nominal strain. Yeah, so, so to really identify, okay, is the load that I apply really the load uh, that should be applied? Um, and um, you can, uh, with the Young's modulus you, or elastic modulus, you can, quickly check um, if the load uh, uh, is applied that should be applied. Then uh, we typically apply strain uh, gauge chains um, like it is shown here on the top right side. Uh, this is for um, identifying stress gradients and we also have often here um, uh, two strain gauges out of um, the center position. So uh, this is checked for um, the symmetry of the loading. Now looking uh, what can happen um, and here is uh, also um, quite important um, phenomena that uh, if it is not considered for example in a finite element analysis um, um, you can get uh, different results between your simulation and your reality because you see a non-linearity uh, due to geometry. So a non-linear relationship between the strain um, and the load. So this is important to really identify this and consider this in your further evaluations. Finally, we get something uh, like this, so a quite interesting specimen. So we have here in this area, we have a kink uh, in the slope between strain and load. So you can think what is happening here. Um, we see here the position of the strain gauge, so in the strain gauge 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, uh, and we see, oh yeah, there is something happening. And what is happening is, uh, yeah, uh, uh, was identified. We see we have um, a linear relationship until um, approximately 2.5 um, uh, kilonewton loads, but then um, we get um, a different slope. And this is due to loosening of contacts between the sheets because um, we know doing welding, we get some distortion and uh, this distor distortion um, can, um, yeah, represent itself uh, typically as a distortion, but if you have a contact like it is shown here, um, 
uh, in the gap of this material and uh, during welding these um, these two sheets want to uh, move towards each other and they cannot move towards each other uh, you get some repressive uh, compressive residual stresses here in this surface and um, you need some initial load uh, that these surface are again um, uh, then uh, they lose uh, that they can lose contact and this is what you see here so it's really important uh, that you have these measurements to understand what is happening. So, um, yeah, another um, example um, where we uh, really need to look quite into detail is uh, shown here. So we see here um, a longitudinal stiffer, stiffener. So we have a, a, a base plate and we have two stiffeners, one on the upside, uh, upper side, uh, one on the lower side, and um, those are welded uh, to this base plate. We have see here also two strain gauges. Um, those are used for measuring clamping stresses because um, as you know, probably um, during welding we get a, a distortion. So for this one, it would be mostly an angular distortion. And um, if you clamp a specimen, you really need to uh, consider the clamping st stresses. So uh, actually you induce a load or a stress if you clamp the specimen in your test rig, if you don't uh, adapt it, uh, the test rig, um, that it um, um, that it somehow um, considers these uh, angular distortions um, and does not um, include clamping stresses. So, but in, typically in principle, um, those clamping stresses aren't used. And so what we did was um, some fatigue tests with this longitudinal stiffeners, um, but to, in order to understand the outcome, we also performed a strain measurement. Um, as you see here, um, uh, in this picture, you see here the weld. Um, and the weld you see, uh, is it, it is this weld, this fatigue critical weld detail um, displayed um, here uh, in a top view. And what you see here is a strain gauge. And if you show it, uh, if you look at it closely, you see it um, here. And this one uh, here is a cross section. And um, the strain gauges are positioned, of course, not directly on the base, uh, on, on the material, because you have some, 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 some adhesives between them, but they are positioned quite close to the weld. And uh, this one is a failed specimen. So here is a fatigue crack. Um, if I would uh, uh, print the weld, it would look like this. So here we have the weld, and then uh, we have a fatigue crack uh, growing uh, through the base material. And actually what we did was we um, started um, the, the strain gauge analysis. Oh, sorry. Um, strain gauge analysis, um, and we did clamp the specimen. So um, we clamp the specimen and what you see due to the angular misalignment, we get strains. Now, so we get strains um, up to uh, nearly 2000 microns, so quite high strain. Then um, if we unclamp it, the specimen, we see, oh, there was happening something. So we see uh, at the strain gauge one, so the one closest to the weld, we see a residual strain. So um, what happened? Um, I think you can you can see it see it uh, uh, on the right side where the actual load is. Um, oh no! Um, oh no! Uh, we, uh, that oh no no! Um, yeah, no I, I, I stick to this middle picture here. Um, so um, what happens is that due to the clamping stresses and due to the the residual stresses, the yield limit is exceeded and um, yeah, the material yield did yield. So, so we have some plastic uh, deformations for this. Um, then if we clamp it again, we have the same stress strains um, as we had doing the first clamping and then we apply the load. And you see, if we apply the load, you get quite high strains. And um, uh, yes, and this is quite important to really see, okay, what is up, what's happening, yeah, especially if we want to consider residual stresses. And we see here, we have high residual stresses in the beginning, and we have, um, again, additionally, these clamping stresses. And it means uh, uh, at the beginning of the fatigue testing, um, we are near the, uh, we are near yield. Yeah? So we have really um, high tensile residual stresses up to the yield stress. And this is also 
important to understand the fatigue behavior. Another thing is, um, and this is, let's say, what why we are doing this. Um, um, we want to perform a final, we want to analyze um, the specimens um, um, to, to identify how much stresses or strains these um, specimens endure, and therefore we need a finite element uh, simulations. And uh, these finite element simulations are quite um, important. And, and here you see um, a comparison between a numerical uh, determined strains and um, um, experimentally de determined strains. And there you see um, a quite huge difference. So this is a finite element model and um, um, the curve um, plots the numerically determined strains. And here we see uh, the markers uh, that are uh, the results from the strain gauge. So this really doesn't doesn't fit. So we we need to improve um, the simulation uh, to be able to fit the finite element model to the results we get uh, from um, the, the from, from the experiments. And as I said, this is quite important. Maybe one additional issue um, is um, to see the failures uh, criteria. And uh, what you see here, I hope you see the video, is again a, a view on this um, um, longitudinal stiffener. And this is what's happening during fatigue test. So we see quite in the beginning, so after 10% of life, we see some cracks initiating. And these cracks are then running um, through the base metal and then um, the, the specimen is broken. So it's quite important to really understand um, what's happening. So is it a crack initiation we're dealing with? How long is the uh, uh, crack propagation phase? And uh, this is important when we are talking about fatigue assessment approaches. Um, so typically we have approaches for um, crack initiation. So nominal stress, structural stress, not stress approach. Um, and um, with these um, approaches, we can only assess crack initiation no crack propagation, and then we have a fracture mechanics. And so we really need to know what's, what's up in the tests and um, how um, this failure behavior can be correlated uh, with a fatigue assessment approach. So it's crucial to understand the failure behavior of component under cyclic loads, uh, to validate the loading by experimental strain analysis, and especially for welded joints um, to avoid the stresses due to clamping or at least to include them in the assessment and to consider welding residual stresses. So now um, I am did run a little bit out of time, but uh, I'd like to go quite quickly through the following slides. So it's some research projects, um, some, some slides about um, cast components. So here is uh, the influence uh, of a surface, of the cast surface condition on the fatigue life. So uh, we're talking about uh, graphite degeneration, ferrite seams, perlite seams, um, and so on, and their effect on the fatigue life. So if you're considering a bulk material in a fatigue test, so here plotted nominal stress amplitude versus cycles, we see we have um, um, quite high fatigue strength um, for bulk material, but if we include surface roughness, or if we really include the surface um, um, uh, in cast conditions, we see we have quite a huge decrease in fatigue strength. So um, this can, of course, be improved by um, shot peening. So we, we again uh, uh, get an increase in fatigue strength um, due to um, inducing residual stresses and also due to uh, improvement of the surface condition. So there's another uh, important uh, project um, dealing with variable amplitudes and load um, and overloads. So uh, we took here specimens out of a, um, a machine carrier from a, a, a wind energy um, uh, a turbine and uh, did investigate um, the fatigue behavior with overloads and after under overloads. Uh, and we see here that um, with overloads uh, that lead to res uh, tensile residual stresses, uh, quite low and durable strain amplitudes can be endured. And um, maybe finally, I just, because I think there might be some question, um, I'll go quickly through the slides. Um, another issue is uh, also here again, uh, welded joints. So improvement of welding processes to achieve mild weld tone notches um, 
uh, is the aim of the project. And uh, what we try is to uh, improve the welding process um, uh, here, for example, by inductive pre and post heating, uh, but also uh, by other means uh, and uh, want to finally get some um, the, uh, we want to see some influence of the material strength on the fatigue strength of welded joints, but because this is typically not the case. Um, also here, uh, fatigue uh, of welded joints under multi axial loading, um, another research project. And as last slide, um, I just got it from colleagues. Uh, this is a, a currently started project there. It's about um, monitoring actually um, structural health monitoring um, the area of wind energy. So um, the aim is to qualify uh, these uh, crowd connections as they are shown on the in the in the left uh, on the left side and develop a structural health monitoring system um, uh, to identify um, a degradation of this crowd joint. So. Um, I'm at the end of my presentation. It was a little bit quick, um, but I hope uh, I could have uh, uh, shown you some uh, helpful information. And um, we have four minutes left, so I would be happy to answer any questions for you. Many thanks. Thank you, Jörg. Um, I see there's a question in the chat uh Jörg, are you able to see this yes how do um, you mitigate confirmation bias in fea models especially related to fatigue uh, where you have already numerical experimental results um i don't think i really understand this question uh, so it's about uh, the difference uh, between uh, numerical uh, me measured, uh, measured, uh, experimentally measured strains and numerically derived strains. May I answer by the microphone? Yes, per perfect. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you. So, so um, when, when we we build an FEA model, uh, we we can uh, um, define the boundary condition in in a really uh, different uh, ways, and and when we already obtained, let's say, a calculated result. It uh, sometimes happens with, with many engineers that they want to confirm it uh, just um, and, and they're getting closer by the FEA results. So so I was yes. just uh, wondering uh, how, how do you uh, keep keep the objectivity of, uh, of, of the finite element uh, results and, and make sure you, you always uh, right, uh, use the right method? Yeah, actually, um, let's say, um, how can we validate the model? The model we can validate with the experimental strain analysis. So this is the data we have. So quite local information from the tests. And um, actually, um, we had here, um, we used a rigid clamping. And this rigid clamping, as it is shown before, did not really represent the reality. Then um, we had to introduce some 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 flexibility. It's not shown here on the uh, bottom left side in the finite element model, but we had to introduce some uh, a realistic stiffness of the clamping itself, but also uh, for the test trick. And uh, this stiffness uh, was optimized uh, to fit, um, let's say, or to get an agreement. Um, of course, um, there's always a question, uh, does this stiffness really um, uh, fit uh, the reality? Um, can they say, OK, if, if we test it also, if we test it, perform a dynamic test and if the strain gauges are positioned in a, in a, in a, in a, in a yeah, uh, smart position, I think we can get uh, a very close uh, or very good um, representation. So there is, let's say, no much um, insecurity in this approach. I yeah. hope this answered the question, at least partly. Thank you very much. It's ready. Thank you. OK, thank you for the question. Wonderful. I think we have time for maybe one more question. If anyone has anything. If not, um, as we said in the beginning, we will be sharing the presentations. And in those presentations, you also find Jörg and Jakob's contact information that if you have any questions, you can feel free to reach out, of course, directly to them. Um, 
But at this point, then I think I would like to say thank you very much to Jörg um, for your for the wonderful presentation. A um, lot of a lot of information, a lot of exciting work happening at LBF. Um, and um, then thank you to everyone that's attended for today. Um, and if you have anything after the sem after the session today, please feel free to send us an email. Um, I, the one we've been putting up throughout the throughout the day was Medis. His email again is m e b a at force d k. Um, but if you just find a force email, mention the seminar, and we'll, the information will get to us if you're not able to to find that. So, but again, thank you very much. And I would like to say thank you to all the presenters and um, then have a wonderful evening, everyone, and a Merry Christmas as you get as you uh, as you get closer and wrap up the year. Thank you very much and um, we'll be seeing you next time um, when we're uh, talking about some more seminars in uh, next year. Find some interest more interesting topics to 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 bring up and uh, bring to discussion. Thank you everyone until next time. Yep. Bye. Thank you. Bye.